Welcome back everyone, I'm Diglo Buffalo, and this is Let's Play The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. When we last left off, we were kind of stuck in uh, what seemed like an infinite loop. We kept using our, I don't know, call it dimension hopping improbability drive, and we kept ending up in the same place over and over and over. Actually, there was something that we might be able to do in order to get to where we want to go. Okay. Turn on drive. Okay, listen. Hear the deep distant hum of a star drive coming from far below. Hmm, far below? Is that where we want to be? Yes, finally! That's where we want it to be. War chamber, spread before you. Astonishingly enough, is the war chamber of a star battle cruiser. Through the domed canopy of the ship, you can see a vast battle fleet flying information behind you through the black, glittering emptiness of space. Ahead is a star system towards which you are hurtling at a terrifying speed. There is an ultraplasmic vacuum all here. Standing near you are two creatures who are gazing at the star system with terrible hatred in their eyes. One is wearing black jeweled battle shorts, and the other is wreathed in a cloud of green, sweet-smelling steam. They are engaged in conversation. The fleet continues to hurtle sunwards. So, here is an ultraplasmic vacuum awl, which is the last tool that we need. So, let's take the awl. Taken. While we're here, let's look at sun. The approaching star is a small, unregarded yellow sun, with nine planets of varying sizes. The third planet catches your attention. The fleet continues to hurtle sunwards. Look at... third planet. It is an utterly insignificant little blue-green planet, of the sort where they probably still wear digital watches. So it's probably Earth. So what else can we do? Listen to conversation. Okay. Hated planet snarls the Vulherg. Home of he that dared to say, look at the Spencer machine, rasps the Gigigvent. Detested words. Even now it sticks my soul to hear them uttered, barks the Vulherg. Even though 10,000 years have passed, and as many senseless megadeaths, Worlds destroyed, my race and yours laid to waste, all because of he that dared shape Look at the Spensor machine. Torture to my Vulhergish warrior heart to hear it spoken. Yet, even now, the hot breath of our vengeance blows hard upon this little world. Vengeance on him who said, look at the Spensor machine. Yes, there's no need to keep repeating it, growls the Vulherg. One happy thought, adds the Gigigvent. After millennia of bloody and perpetual conflict, our races have been brought together by this quest for the source of the offending remark. Perhaps after our vengeance has been exacted on him who said, look at the Spencer machine, will you stop saying it? Perhaps we will continue to live in peace and harmony and we will talk about this after we... Who's this? The two creatures turn and stare at you. The fleet continues to hurtle sunwards. I don't know, say hello? Let's wait some more. Time passes. Let's wait again. Your simple act of kindness at the moment of great personal anxiety, you fed the dog, remember, now brings rich rewards. The battle fleet plunges towards Earth and spots the dog, which appears to them as a gigantic monster, cheerfully tucking into a cheese sandwich. The Vulhergs and Gugugvins are moved by the simple picture of happiness, compared with the furious savagery of their own lives. They think back to a day when they used to relax over an odd cheese sandwich themselves, often at sunset, after a hardy day working in the fields back on Vulhergen and Gugugvia, and decide to return and rebuild their homes in a new spirit of harmony and cooperation. Grateful, they offer to drop you at the heart of gold on the way home. After a brief 900 parsec trip, you are escorted into the transporter chamber of the warship. The transporter glows and your surroundings change. Maze. This is part of a spongy gray maze of twisty little synapses all alike. Well, what we learned is that we were aboard that microscopic space fleet that 
apparently the dog ignored back in the beginning of the game. And now we've been transported back to the heart of gold, but still in microscopic form because we're in a maze that is part of a spongy gray maze of twisty little synapses. And where are synapses? Well, in the brain. An electrical impulse across a synapse gap temporarily blocks your way. So let's try to go west. We can't go there either. Let's go east. Maze, this is part of a spongy gray maze of twisty little synapses all alike. We can't go east again, so let's go north. Luckily, this is not a real maze, as in that you have to find your way through. It's just you have to go through a certain number of rooms before you get to where you go. The direction in which you go doesn't matter as long as you go through varying rooms and you're not blocked temporarily by an electrical impulse. So, again, electrical impulse maze. This is part of a spongy maze of uh, twisty little synapses all alike. Blocking the gap between two synapses is, is a large black particle. There seem to be some faint markings on it. So let's read the markings. As you look closer, you see inscribed in tiny letters on the particle. Sense, common, for, dent, Arthur, for a placement, order part, number 31541. Okay, so here's our common sense. So if we take particle, as you remove the particle, electrical impulses begin leaping madly across the now unblocked synaptic gap. Unfortunately, you were in the gap at the time. Everything becomes dark again. So we now should be back on the heart of gold in the room with all our tools. And we want to drop the all. We should now have nine tools here. Apparently we just removed our common sense from our brain. What does that do for us? Well, what we can do is now go south. If we remember back, the Hitchhiker's Guide said that intelligence can be reconciling two contradictory things. And we have to give a sign of intelligence to the door in order to get into that other room. So we want to go here. Actually, first we want to do a save. Let's say four. Go up. And we want to take the T. So we've dropped no T. But since we now have no common sense, we can take no T. No T taken. And now we have T and no T. So we have two contradicting things. And we can go down and back to the corridor and show T and no T to door. T, the door says, big deal, anyone can have T. No T, the door is almost speechless with admiration. Wow, simultaneous T and no T. My apologies, you're clearly a heavy duty philosopher. It opens respectful. But another thing we have to now do is that if we just walk into this new room, which is the room that uh, Marvin has taken residence in, Marvin the paranoid android, who is terribly depressed all the time. We are so overcome by the depression that he emanates that we promptly die. So we need to first make ourselves really, really, really happy in order to be able to survive that room. And well, what makes Arthur really, really, really happy? Well, the first item in our inventory for the whole game has been that we have no tea. Now we actually have tea. So let's drink tea. It is the finest tea you have ever tasted. It has almost made this entire misadventure seem worthwhile. You experience several moments of complete happiness and relaxation. The cup itself vaporizes, part of the galactic anti-litter program. Okay, so now we can go into the room. Upon entering the room, you are battered by tidal waves of depression. However, the happiness derived from your high score and the thoroughly excellent cup of tea you had recently help you survive. Marvin's Pantry. This is a small closet with an exit to starboard. Marvin the paranoid android is here. There is a thermal fusion chisel here. So let's take the chisel. Taken. We can go back out and back to our tools. We can drop the chisel and we should have our 10 tools. Hold on, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, plus chisel, 10. 
So let's go back and take the pot. Look at plant. The plant is now large and leafy. Hanging from it is a large succulent fruit. So let's eat fruit. The fruit has a zesty taste and you devour it greedily. Suddenly your vision wavers and you see yourself as though from a distance standing near Marvin who asks you for a number 12 asteroid paint chipper. Then the image vanishes like a movie when the film breaks and you find yourself still in the corridor for end. It seems that this plant is a rare horticultural phenomenon long thought to be extinct, the tree of foreknowledge. So now we know that we need the paint chisel. So let's drop the pot, go north, take the chisel. And now we can go back to Marvin and tell him Marvin. Open hatch. Humans are so depressingly demeaning. Do this, pick up that, unjam the opening mechanism of the other, Meet me in the hatchway access space in 12 turns, I suppose, he mutters. You can count up to 12. So hard to know with morons. And don't forget to bring the proper tool, which we now know is the chisel, so we can go east and down. We can only bring one item into the access space, so we have to drop all. Take the chisel and go into the hatchway. The entrance is so narrow that, that you probably couldn't pass by holding anything. Well, maybe one thing. Oh, hold on, what are we still holding? Oh, we're holding our gown or wearing our gown. Drop gown. Remove gown, hopefully this will work out. because we only have 12 turns, which could screw us over. Access space. This tiny area with an exit to port is for working on the hatch mechanism, which is vastly more complicated than your rather ordinary intelligence can comprehend. The floor is an open metal mesh, like the floor of a catwalk. Marvin shambles in. So let's wait. Time passes. Marvin, looking bored, says, hand me a number 12 asteroid paint chipper. So give, wait, do we take the chipper or the chisel? I have a terrible feeling about this. Damn it. So I'll make a quick cut here and I'll be back when I have the right tool, <laughs> which I screwed up exact because now Marvin will actually move off and will not be willing to ever try this again. So the game becomes unwinnable if you don't bring the right tool. So, um, well, hold on a second and I'll be right back with the correct tool. Okay, we're back and we're back in the access space, this time with the right tool, which this time, because I saved it before I ate the fruit of foreknowledge, this time it turned out we needed the wrench, not the paint chipper. So we have our laser assisted monkey wrench and here comes Marvin. Marvin, looking bored, says, hand me the laser-assisted monkey wrench. So give wrench to Marvin. Marvin fiddles inside the mechanism with the laser-assisted monkey wrench for about three-tenths of a second. You hear the hatchway slide open. I don't expect you to be grateful, says Martin, or even interested, but that was probably more complicated than every single action you'll ever perform in your entire life put together. He limps away. And me, you hear mutter as he goes, with this terrible pain and all the diodes down my left side. All right, so we open the hatch and we can exit the ship. So hatchway, let's go down. You step onto the landing ramp, leading down towards the surface of the legendary lost planet of Magrathea. Announcement, announcement, this is Eddie, the shipboard computer. Announcement, announcement, this is Eddie, the shipboard computer. Someone is leaving the ship on a strange planet without wrapping up all nice and warm. It'll all end in tears, I just know it, the voice fades behind you. Ramp, the wind moans, dust drifts across the surface of the alien world. Zephot, Ford and Trillian appear and urge you forward. 
Slowly, nervously, you step downwards, the cold, thin air rasping in your lungs. You set one single foot on the ancient dust, and almost instantly the most incredible adventure starts, which you'll have to buy the next game to find out about. By the way, there was a causal relationship between your taking the toothbrush and the tree collapsing at the very beginning of the game. We apologize for the slight inaccuracy. Your score is 400 out of, of a possible 400 in 608 turns. Would you like to start over, restore a safe position, get hints, or end the session of the game? So this ends the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy text adventure. It ended on kind of a strange note in the middle of everything. Apparently they were planning to do a sequel, which however never materialized. And considering this game, I don't know if it would have been an entirely good idea to begin with. I mean, this game is a classic, but I think it is more of a classic because uh, Douglas Adams was involved and it was based on the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy because other than that some of the puzzles at least to me are very very obtuse in the sense that you know Douglas Adams for all the weird things that he thinks up is a great author and his books are great to read but for him to be creating puzzles in the same way might not necessarily be a good idea because not everything here really makes sense. A lot of the stuff is hinted at very obscurely in the, in the guide and you have to look a whole lot of things up, which makes sense because, you know, it's the game of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. But maybe it would have been uh, better if some things would have been made clearer in, in the general text of the game. But none of that is terrible for the game. It just makes it very hard and sometimes very frustrating to kind of try and uh, come up with the correct solutions. I mean, who would think to look up fluff, pocket fluff, in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy in order to get to the uh, solution for the problem with the Tree of Foreknowledge and, and getting the correct tool at the end. Another problem is that, as we saw, the game very easily becomes unwinnable and that is can be very frustrating. But... You know, it's still an interesting game. I would uh, stop short of calling it a good game compared to other games, especially uh, the game I did beforehand, Let the Goddess of Phobos. That was, it was different. It was made later, so maybe it was built on some experience that he had made, that Infocom and Steve Moretzky in first person, who wrote both Let the Goddess of Phobos and co-wrote this game, Maybe he was more experienced and had a better idea of how to construct a game that was uh, less frustrating and less difficult to really grasp. I don't know, but it was still an interesting game, if nothing else. And uh, I'll thank you for listening to me ramble on and reading all this text terribly. As I said, thank you for watching. And if you enjoyed it, consider leaving a like or a comment. And I will see you the next time. So until then, have a good one.